However much Roman Catholics wish to freeze present institutional arrangements for managing human sexuality, traditional institutions are unraveling and transmogrifying, and it may well be that the proliferation of lifestyle alternatives is essential to the process by which society will eventually settle down to new and more wholesome patterns. My illustrations give the puzzle concrete grip. How does religion that sets out to serve what is good to help people grow in the knowledge of God and love God, love God and neighbor. How does biblical religion that sees every human being as created in God's image come to sponsor what liberals regard as obvious human rights uh, violations? How do its promoters, brilliant in mind and zealous of heart, come to feel confident and comfortable in reasoning in these ways? My answer is that they get there by four simple, but probably unconscious, easy steps. I hope that by the time I finish, my diagnosis will seem as obvious as Bishop Robinson's. So step one, social modeling and the argument from tradition. If you read my piece in The Guardian, you can turn out for this bit. The practices and policies of Christian religion are rationalized in terms of beliefs about God and divine purposes. Foundational for biblical religion generally, and Christianity in particular, is the conviction that God is very, very big, and we are very, very small. This starting point has two consequences for theological method. First, the size gap makes appeals to tradition reasonable. Consider the analogy of human parents and their offspring, where the size gap, albeit reduced, is still significant. It takes human infants roughly 18 years to get initiated into the adult world. They work up on it by successive approximations as their cognitive and emotional capacities grow and develop. Adults orient children by teaching them certain ways of being in the world, ways of seeing and valuing what they experience. So also, and all the more so, so with Godhead. When it comes to getting a grip on who God is and what God wants with the human race, the human learning curve is very steep. There is no way we could figure it all out by ourselves in one short lifetime. The Bible covers 1,700 years of feeling after and trying to find out the most elementary points, such as that God is not into child sacrifice. And it took 1,800 more years to figure out that God really doesn't like slavery. This makes it reasonable for human beings in trying to get oriented to God and God's world to put themselves to school to tradition and to put their own experience in dialogue with what their forebears have taught. Second, Theology trades and social analogies. In biblical religion, God and the people of God form a society. Down through the ages, when adherents try to express what we are to God and who God is to us, they naturally take their own society as a model. The method is simple. They say, it's as if God occupies these roles and we occupy those roles. Then they read off the role expectations, what human beings might be able to count on from God and what God might require of us. Thus, in the Bible, God is the husband and Israel the wife. God is the king or emperor and Israel the chosen people. God the monarch, uh, oh God, God's son is the monarch. Um, is, um, God is a friend to Abraham and Moses and to everyone who believes in Jesus. God is the father of, and believers are adopted children. In fact, scripture and tradition reflect roughly 3,700 years of human history, during which forms of human social organization have varied significantly. Down the centuries, many contrasting social systems and roles have been mapped onto the heavens. The sky's size gap means this is all to the good because God is too big to squeeze into many merely human social roles. Each is at best an analogy that captures something while distorting something else. Map mapping up many models on top of one another allows us to view God from many angles. Liberal theologians like me would say the process can and should go on forever. Religion would become a dead letter and the size gap would be radically underestimated if tradition, what's already been handed down, were allowed to have this, the last word. But where God and the people of God are concerned, social mo modeling is not only natural and necessary, but it's, uh, it's invidious because human social systems that we project onto the heavens are inevitably unjust. I've said it before and I'll say it again human social competence is poor. We don't have the imagination and the goodness to organize utopia. So what we do is map up imperfect social systems that contain, that spin off systemic evils um, that we don't anticipate and uh, 
basically casting God in the social roles of those systems already makes God complicit in the systemic evils of the social systems that we mapped up. So the point is we, we use social analogies, but all of our social systems spawn systemic evils. So in mapping up the, so, the social system and assigning God a role in it, we've already made God complicit. Step two, true religion and civil religion conflated. Theological method already dirties God's ha hands a little bit, the way America's most upstanding human rights advocates can't entirely wash their hands of every grape. But the God of the Bible plunges in up to his elbows, and I use the masculine pronoun advisedly, when true religion gets conflated with civil religion. True religion teaches that God alone is worthy of worship. Torah sums up God's purposes in an enlightened theology of life, that God is, God is life. For everything else, God is the source of life and its only reliable sustainer. Human beings are entitled neither to life nor to the means of its preservation, but to, are called to receive life as a gift, gift which God can be trusted to keep on giving forever. Because material life cannot be naturally permanent or self-sustaining, God's covenants with human beings, for, he covenants with the human beings for a lifestyle of courteous consumption. Human beings will be welcome to use the resources of God's world so long as they live as courteous guests who acknowledge their host and respect life and God's other creatures. Nevertheless, true religion has its competitors. Durkheim was right. Human societies are essentially self-deifying. They make an idol of their own survival. So civil religion sets up a rival creed. Society is the source of life and its only reliable sustainer. As a sine qua non of individual existence, society's existence and flourishing are sacred. Therefore, individuals who owe their existence to society owe it to society to be and do their part to maintain society and enable it to flourish, not least by living out their assigned social roles. Civil religion is very strong and easily disguises itself as true religion by turning God into a tribal totem or team mascot. God is represented as a supernatural founder and enforcer of the existing social order. God's reason for being is to win battles, to secure land, a land rich in resources, to provide the good weather necessary for successful farming, and in general to guarantee the survival and prosperity of the social order. Key for present purposes is that God is no longer merely complicit in systemic evils like any member of society who may or may not recognize, may or may not personally approve of such policies and consequences. Within idolatrous civil religion, God is their author and enforcer. Moreover, the all-wise God sees through all the systemic consequences and sponsors the present social order with open eyes.